<laughs> now it's not often in life that you'll get to see the uh, chairman of the uh, ghost club standing in front of some kittens, <laughs> which I think is also a unique and whoop, I'm feeling bad. If you can hear my voice. <laughs> now I can't promise a talk uh, with the academic uh, or scientific highbrow qualities that we had this morning. Um, I thought I would go a little bit sort of down down market, more more akin to what I, the level I feel com most comfortable at operating. Um, so I thought we'd look at some bad ghosts and bad ghost hunters. Um, I have upscaled this talk actually because the original version was called Crap Ghosts. And, crap ghosts. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, the media is absolutely awash <coughs> with bad ghosts. I mean, every day we see pictures and videos that claim to show astounding proof of the paranormal, which are presented to an often unquestioning audience <laughs> who, for the most part, fervently hope that death isn't permanent and that demons do in fact stalk our every sleeping and waking moment. Bad ghosts have now become the staple of our social media feeds and regularly adorn the pages of magazines and newspapers. Now the reasons for this flood of bad ghost pictures and videos are numerous. Some are obviously posted by people who are genuinely perplexed and bewildered by what they have captured on their cameras. Others are used to drum up viewers for some ailing TV series. Or to promote a new, never been seen before ghost hunting show on YouTube that's most likely, in all honesty, never to be seen again. And many of these pictures and ghosts claim to show irrefutable proof for the existence of ghosts. Sadly, it is also apparent that many of these pictures are obvious hoaxes, willfully posted by Paris celebrities in order to boost their status with their following followers and their fans. For example, this particular ghost post came from one of the UK's many self-proclaimed leading psychics. Now, normally I don't really bother giving these very much more than a cursory glance when they appear on Facebook, but on this particular occasion, having a few minutes to spare, I downloaded the image and took a closer look. Described in the comments intriguingly as showing a genuine shadow figure caught on camera during an investigation of a popular ghost hunting venue, this left me wondering just how anyone could fall for this particular bad ghost. And for the benefit... And for the benefit of every, anyone here who might be thinking that this might just be a genuine example of a shadow figure caught on camera, allow me to turn up the exposure settings and I think that you will soon see the real cause of this particular bad ghost. Proving indeed that the edge from you too does occasionally go ghost hunting. <laughs> Now, this is another bad ghost, or rather, a bad demon. <laughs> this particular genuine image was posted in 2017 on one of the world's largest paranormal Facebook, face group, Facebook groups by a lady in Pennsylvania who claimed that she had been attacked by a demon. The picture is still captured from a video was apparently taken without her knowledge as she slept in her hotel room where she was attending a convention. She added that it was the following day after she returned home and was looking through the pictures and the videos that she had taken during the convention that she realised that something supernatural had taken place while she was alone in her hotel room. Now believing herself to be possessed and claiming to have no memory of the demonic attack, she was seeking the advice and the assistance from a demonologist 
or an exorcist. And in recent months, this same hotel in which the lady claimed to have been attacked has now become a mecca for investigators, demonologists and wannabe exorcists who insist that the succubus, a name for a sexually predatory demon, is in fact very real and has attacked many others, both men and women, so beware. And it seems that many bad ghosts share a common characteristic, this being that they normally require the addition of a red circle to be placed around them <laughs> to enhance the viewer's visual perception of the ghost. Whilst occasionally other shapes and colours are substituted, a red circle is, most com is the most commonly used indicator of a bad ghost. Like this, for example, from March of 2018, complete with the requisite red circle. The description supplied was as follows, and I will quote, real ghost caught on camera entering into the woman in public road. There's a theme here about ghosts and entering women, but... <laughs> Even with the helpful red circle, try as I might, I just cannot see this particular bad ghost. But perhaps if we, collectively, together, examine the video, someone here might be able to do a little better. Anyone? So I'm not just alone then. <laughs> I genuinely couldn't say it. I spent. I didn't play it backwards like the EVP no, that's people. Where you went on. <laughs> these days, it seems almost everyone wants to be a ghost hunter. Currently, in the United Kingdom, there are over 900 separate ghost hunting teams. Over in the USA, the numbers are higher. Uh, currently, standing at almost 3,000 paranormal groups. In December of 2018, the Daily Mail claimed that there were 12,000 professional paranormal investigators in the UK and that the majority were apparently female. The same article continued, stating that 52% of the population believe in the existence of ghosts and that one in five, 20%, claim almost to have seen a ghost. Ghost hunting has now become a cool way to spend your Saturday night with your mates. Battling against evil possessing demons, listening attentively to the disembodied voices of the dead on your broken radio, or watching through bleary eyes as the spirits flash the multicoloured lights on your ghost detector. But before all the investigators in the room mumble indignantly, as I can hear quietly, our group isn't like right that, I am of course generalising a little as of course not everyone in the room is fortunate enough to regularly do battle with demons or lucky enough to hear the anguished pleas of the undead on their eBay EVP devices. <laughs> Despite a passion for this latest item of cool ghost hunting tech in order to assist them in their quest, many investigators still rely on those good old-fashioned methods which have always proved so gloriously unreliable in the past. Table tipping, dousing, mediumship remain popular today with the cash strapped and the spiritually inclined. The paranormal investigators have always been a creative and an inventive bunch and down the years many items have been pressed into service to aid the investigators in their quest for answers. These include a range of purpose designed meters and devices for measuring or observing the various emissions that emanate from ghosts. And these days may also include an assortment of children's toys, often stuffed with a wondrous array of electronic devices that claim to indicate the presence of some playful and interacting spirit. Sometimes investigators use things that it's even hard to comprehend why, and yes, that is a claw hammer. <laughs> <laughs> Let that one just sink in for a minute. They're holding a seance whilst holding a claw hammer. But it's not even just the equipment in which diversity is demonstrated. There exists a multitude of methods derived from a host of theories, ideas, notions and beliefs. Some might appear bizarre. Others might seem more credible. Some even may, say, may appear to be plausible. The Gansfeld, for example, 
is an experiment in sensory deprivation that is used within parapsychology to study effects upon the mind that has now been pressed into service by the ghost hunters. <laughs> Not quite how to make it play. Now, let's go back and just give it one more attempt. Because <laughs> it's worth seeing, honestly. Ah, here we go. And as so ha ha happens with any new and promising technique, other investigators rush headlong to test the initial claim by conducting their own replication experiments, which, after all, is a basis of good science. Like this example from UK-based Para-X, who have about 27,000 followers on Facebook. Now, what's really intriguing about this is that they seem to have overlooked one of their investigators demonstrating an X-Man-like superpower. Oh, come on. Ghost dimension. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's almost like they're going to be on their own trying to stop all the people you don't. Don't try to help. Don't try to stop all the people unless you are sort of experienced with this approach. <laughs> this is a first for us and you know so so it's going to happen and you and you and you so you might do it on These days one only has to flick through the television channels to pick up a newspaper, scroll through your social media feed each morning whilst on the toilet, to realise that there is a strong and sustained interest in the paranormal, particularly when it relates to ghosts, to hauntings and other spontaneous phenomena. This interest though is not a new thing, a search through the archives will turn up a wealth of articles that date back to the earliest broadsheets and newspapers. It could be argued that the media plays a significant role in sustaining the current levels of interest. But in reality, the media might also be just reflecting society's interest. After all, ghosts sell copy and are good business. Investigators, however, love to emulate their TV heroes and are often to be seen clad in the traditional ghost fighter's uniform of a baggy black fleece and a SWAT-style fishing jacket. The pocket stuffed with every assortment of special gadget and ghost tracking device, ready to deploy at a moment's notice. Meanwhile, a chosen few, those who have special skills or training, demonstrate their ninja-like superpowers by communicating directly with the ghosts, 
Sometimes, this bike might merely be the disgruntled phantasm of a murderer who insists on hanging around and who contents himself in the afterlife by flinging the occasional pebble. But increasingly, the ninja investigators are now forced to deal with an evil and possessing demon of the most dreadful kind, one that must be exercised with extreme prejudice, before closing the interdimensional portal that someone inadvertently left ajar whilst innocently playing with their Barbie Ouija board. <laughs> the often dramatic portrayal of paranormal investigating in TV and film plays a part in this developing trend and has produced a number of paranormal celebrities whose views, whose opinions and methods have become highly influential. In a recent poll of the most influential ghost investigators, it was therefore not too surprising to discover that at number one is Ed and Lorraine Warren, closely followed by Zach Bagans from Ghost Adventures, John Zaffis, the haunted collector, Ryan Buell from Paranormal State, Jason and Grant Wilson, the plumbers from Ghost Hunters, and of course our very own and the very lovely Yvette Fielding from Most Haunted. The techniques and the equipment used on the TV shows have become accepted by investigators as the de facto means for conducting their own investigations. And although many of these methods may be described as unproductive at best, occasionally ethically questionable and generally worthless to psychical research, in their favour, I suppose they are in sometimes entertaining to watch. Is it going to do it this time? <laughs> Don't you vicious, miserable computer? Come on. <laughs> It's a shell, he can't even read. <laughs> Social media has now become a rich and fertile resource for those seeking new theories to test or for confirmation of their own ideas. And those who use science are, of course, the most credible. I'll just take a moment to let you read that and absorb the magnificence of that statement. That's science. Sometimes it's also a place to find important advice. Advice that you ignore at your peril. Especially if you leave empty chairs and lying around in haunted houses and the air conditioning turned on. Because spirits exist in cold places after 2am and they often sit in empty chairs. And stare at you. I'm not actually, at first I thought this was actually a parody because of the title, um, but it turned out to, no, it was in fact good advice. <laughs> Just putting it out there, you yeah, know, yeah. <coughs> you heard from the good guys this morning, they might not have all the answers. <laughs> um, what about ethics? I mean, some paranormal investigators seem to have no, no, no desires or limits in the, the lengths that they will go to to prove the afterlife and to capture evidence to support their beliefs. 
in recent years, we've had heard of investigators who have broken into locked buildings and claiming that their uh, pursuit, their hobby, gave them that, the right to do so. Like, for example, there was this clown in America who kicked down a door in order to gain his, uh, access to a historic building which was said to be haunted. And if that wasn't in itself enough, he was also armed with a loaded shotgun and carrying a Bible. <laughs> Meanwhile, over in Ireland, one group announced with some pride that they planned to investigate a mass grave site that contained nearly 800 bodies, mostly those of infants and young children, who had been buried there, many within living memory, as the cemetery only closed in 1961. And you see, it's... Uh, yeah. The whole of that thread actually is, it makes quite painful and fairly uh, sort of uh, the red mist starts to come up by the time you get to the second or third page. Uh, there were similar posts about uh, let's all go on a ghost hunt to Auschwitz. Because yeah. oh, that would be a cool thing to do. Yeah, I'm up for it. Count me in. When are we going? Now, whenever I meet ghost hunting groups it is immediately apparent that there are many within the ghost hunting community who do seek greater, greater knowledge and who wish to participate in some form of additional learning and unfortunately for them it appears that mainstream parapsychology instead of engaging with those who are out there investigating has for the most part chosen instead to completely disassociate itself from the ghost hunters except where there is a media paycheck involved or the opportunity to provide some pseudo-sceptical quote in the press. And I'm glad the sound's been fixed because this next clip is quite interesting, if it bloody works. It always seems to require two years, doesn't it? Before you jump to any form of paranormal explanation, just take in for a minute what the parapsychologist just said. That the scratch above Carl's eye, which manifested in the Clerkenwell House of Detention, was caused by an insect, a small fly, travelling at high speed <laughs> and glancing a blow across Carl's forehead. Before you even consider the paranormal options. <laughs> Abandoned and cast aside like an old sock by the academic mainstream, the investigators have, in fact, been forced to turn onto social media in their search for information and for guidance. And there's certainly no shortage of information either. But much of it's conflicting. It's buried beneath memes, gifs, and inspirational postings about how much people love go going ghost hunting. And under these circumstances, any attempt to find good quality, reliable information does seem to be a forlorn hope. Yeah. Anybody recognise that building by the way? <laughs> no, can't be. That was November 1987. <laughs> there are people who still think that is reality. Searching for Google, searching on Google for ghost hunting courses and training produces countless options for those who might want to develop their knowledge. The internet has kicked out wide open the door to a whole host of organisations offering their own courses and qualifications. And even when the courses are provided by reputable organisations, they are often tailored towards those who wish to become, God forbid, budding parapsychologists. And they're also costly. And whilst there are undoubtedly a small number of well-constructed courses that do provide good quality information, and are a genuinely useful resource for investigators, they are often submerged beneath a tsunami of other ghost hunting courses offered by groups and individuals. Over the years, there have been several attempts to bring some semblance of organisation and standardisation 
So the apparent chaos that the paranormal investigation world has found itself embroiled within. Notably in the UK, ASAP, who have, almost since their foundation in 1981, provided training courses for its membership, unfortunately, when, the, when compared to the, no, the total number of active investigators in the UK, the number of people over the years who have taken advantage of this resource is utterly insignificant. Some of the courses may be genuinely helpful, but how can the end user ever possibly hope to know which courses are good and which courses are questionable? In some instances, it's also apparent that some of the courses are not overly concerned with questions of ethics or aimed at developing good methodologies, and there are always some who are seeking only to cash in on the interest and the desire for information. But at least they give you a certificate. Founded in 1882, the Society for Psychical Research is considered to be, today, the world's foremost paranormal research organisation. Unfortunately, it is also frequently considered to be pre the preserve of psychologists, parapsychologists, anomalistic psychologists and anybody else who has a preference for wearing corduroy. <laughs> <laughs> Even more unfortunately... The vast majority of modern ghost hunters don't even seem to be aware of its existence. I will refer you back to Mark Smith from Parax, with 27,000 followers on Facebook. And we'll do it twice, and we'll hear what he's got to say. Oh, you vicious computer. It's playing. It's playing. It's playing. That's a really sad statement. And it also appears that the Ghost Club, who claim to date back even further to 1862, <coughs> is faring no better when it comes to awareness within the broad ghost hunting community. There's a thing about sex and goats going on in this, isn't there? Maybe, maybe we should form another committee. <laughs> The Society for Psychical Research has, over the past century and a half, investigated countless ghosts and hauntings and has a vast wealth of resources it is able to draw upon and makes a, um, make available for everyone who wishes to avail themselves of the resources. Given that long history, it's perhaps interesting to take a moment and look back on some of the methods that earlier generations of ghost hunters advocated. Take, for example, this method from the 1968 edition of the Notes for Investigators of Spontaneous Case Committee, uh, Cases that suggested that in cases of suspected hoax or fraud, the suspect might be controlled by covering their head in a light-proof black cloth bag, gathered beneath their chin to preclude vision but without hampering their breathing, <laughs> and to tie their feet to the chair and their fingers together behind their back using cotton. And of course investigators of the famous Enfield Poltergeist <coughs> case in 1977 thought absolutely nothing unusual for the two adult male investigators to spend time alone in the bedroom of two young girls whilst they slept, a situation that would be viewed as shockingly irresponsible today. Although the 50-year-old notes for guidance, uh, guidance notes for investigators still contained lots of useful and helpful information, it was becoming clear that a replacement was long overdue. And in 2017, the Society for Psychical Research commissioned a fully revised and updated set of guidance notes for investigators of spontaneous cases. They understood that for the notes to remain relevant in coming years, they should be written in a format that would be easy to update and capable of addressing the current and future trends in paranormal <laughs> investigation methods. And of can you hear my voice? <laughs> and of new knowledge relating to the subject. To this end, the new edition of the guidance notes uses modern printing arrangements that allow it to be published in small batches with rapid accessibility to the master copy for continual updating as required. The book will also be supported by dedicated pages within the Society's website, 
which will provide articles that expand upon the topics contained within the book and they themselves can also be updated as and when required. These steps will allow revisions and changes to be made to the guidance notes, ensuring that the publication keeps pace with changes in methods and equipment and it also includes new research as the information becomes available. <coughs> but there remains a problem, a big <coughs> problem, a great chasm of a problem that must be faced by everyone who wants to provide some form of resource or guidance for investigators. Regardless of the quality of the content or its value to the investigators, for the most part, investigators perceive any courses or offers of training as being irrelevant and worthless. Individuals and groups are generally reluctant, even resistant to change, and often prefer to stick to the methods that they have found that works best for themselves. Methods which they have developed and honed over several series of their favourite ghost hunting TV show, or gleaned while watching and following the leading names in the paranormal. People have a tendency to venerate those who they see portrayed as experts, regardless of whether or not this perception is warranted. The majority of those engaged oh, whoop, excuse me a minute just think the computer may have glitched there 60 61 no the majority of those ah sorry yeah. the majority of those engaged in investigation also consider that they have absolutely nothing to learn from organizations such as the SPR or the ghost club this attitude might be likened to the attitude of many car drivers who consider that their own driving skills are above those of the average this illusory superiority results in people rejecting assistance, often perceiving it as being criticism. They frequently become overly defensive and react strongly when they believe their methods are under threat. The oft quoted, there are no experts in the paranormal, is a typical response and a fallback position to any questioning of their methods or rationale used to explain them. But of course, there are experts. <coughs> Expertise exists in almost every area of paranormal study, be it history, psychology, physics, architecture, sociology, environmental monitoring, I could go on all afternoon. The problem is that it's often difficult to discern just who are the experts and what areas exactly they have expertise in. <coughs> Perceived expertise is often more based upon the claims by the individual themselves or the claims made within the media on their behalf. Cost is also another serious consideration. We heard James this morning talking about the cost of some equipment. And with some courses costing several hundreds of pounds, training is often perceived as being money that is not well spent when compared, for example, to using the cash in order to purchase some new ghost hunting gadget, which is often considered as being significantly more helpful to the investigator. The perception born out of television ghost hunting shows and social media promoted events is that one only has to set foot in a haunted building in order to obtain stunning evidence of paranormal activity. So why pay anything at all? There is a saying that you can lead a horse to water but you can't make it lie down. Is that the right saying? However, the reality is that if good quality information is available, is easy to access and is affordable, then some people, a small number for sure, but some people will access it and gradually over time positive changes will begin to filter through the investigation processes we see appearing on our social media feeds. In 1938, this is inside the SPR, I'm going to mention Harry Price, that's brave. In 1938, Harry Price set down and published what can be considered as the very first set of guidance notes for investigators. They were given out to members of the investigation team he recruited to assist him with the investigation of Baldy Rectory. That book was printed with a blue card cover, which has resulted to it being referred to ever since as the Blue Book. 
almost coincidentally, <laughs> the SPR chose to use a blue card cover for their new set of guidance notes. Ben is just writing, change the colour cover. Uh, use, <laughs> for their new set of guidance notes, commissioned exactly <coughs> 80 years after Price's original. The original blue book was marked private and confidential. But nevertheless, it went on to inspire and to guide many later generations of ghost investigators. And it's my hope, and I hope that it's shared by the society and, have, and by the Ghost Club, that this new edition of Guidance Notes will be more widely distributed and will serve as a guide to the present and future generations of ghost hunters. But a book on its own will never solve the lack of willingness by the investigating community to adopt good practices and to engage with the resources that are available, to view them in a positive way rather than as an enforcement or a criticism. The Society for Psychical Research and the Ghost Club have between them an enormous wealth of resources and experience to draw upon and to offer to the ghost hunting community. I would urge anyone involved with or interested in ghosts or hauntings to seek membership and engage with both organisations as a positive step towards promoting good practices and perhaps increasing our knowledge of those interesting human experiences we call ghosts and hauntings. Mm -hmm.